in these few minutes that I have with you, I'd like to share with you two parables uh, from Surah An-Nur. Surah An-Nur is the 24th Surah of the Qur'an. Many times some of the very difficult lessons and very profound lessons of the Qur'an, Allah teaches by way of giving an example. And oftentimes when you just read a translation of that example, it's kind of hard to make sense of what is being said. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a little bit of background and set the stage to help us better understand these beautiful parables. Not only are they beautiful, I think they're quite scary as well. And this is a place in the Qur'an where actually two things have been contrasted, light and darkness. So I want to talk to you a little bit first about the notion of light in the Qur'an and what Allah refers to as light. One of the first things we learn is Allah Himself calls Himself light. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the skies and the earth. Another place you'll find the usage of the, 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 the term light in the Qur'an is it's actually used as a synonym, as an, an alternative term for guidance itself. That light and guidance are actually considered the same. Just like somebody's in the, in the darkness is the same as saying somebody's misguided. The, the opposite is also true. Somebody's in the light or somebody has light is actually to say that somebody has guidance. It's also important to note that this light Allah describes exists inside the hearts of people. It's inside the hearts of people. And the analogy of light in the Quran is like a, a house at nighttime with an indent or a niche inside the wall with a lamp inside it. And that's, you know, in the old days, the niche used to look like an arch, right? And it's actually similar to the way that the rib cage is shaped. And the lamp in that example is actually a parallel for the heart itself. And so a lit up lamp is like a lit up heart whose glass has to be clean and all of that. But in any case, just the point I was trying to make first and foremost is that the idea of light is, is, in the spiritual sense is something that lives inside our hearts. The reason that analogy is important is because light doesn't stay inside, light goes outside, right? So if somebody, if there's a lamp, its benefit is not only limited to the lamp itself, it illuminates its surroundings, doesn't it? And so if somebody has true guidance inside of their heart and a true faith inside of their heart, they're not only going to be the ones that benefit, everybody around them is also going to be illuminated as a result. And as a matter of fact, light only truly gets appreciated when you're in the dark. In other words, our faith and our iman is only really put to the test and really its benefit comes out when we are surrounded by difficult circumstances, when we're surrounded by misguidance, and often believers you know, feel, you know, if we only lived in better times, if only we lived in the time of the Prophet or you know, we're living in such dark times, etc. That's, that notion entirely is silly. All Prophets, all Prophets were a minority. The believers were, have always been a minority. And the majority of people around them were dark, in the darkness. And so when you say, I wish I was living in those times, uh, you're not wishing for anything much different, maybe even wishing for something much tougher. Right? So that's the first thing I wanted to get out of the way. The second thing I want to talk to you guys about when it comes to this, this idea of light is it's not just something figurative. In other words, obviously if you open up somebody's chest, you're not going to see light inside. But actually a day is coming when you will. On the day of resurrection, Allah actually turns our faith into real, actual light. And we all have to take a walk on Judgment Day after our judgments are done. We have to take a walk towards our final destinations either heaven or hell. And there are people who had faith with them, which is nurun yas'a bayna aydihim wa bi aymanihim. There are two kinds of light that are going to aid us on that day when there's complete darkness. The light is going to be coming out of our chests, and there's another light that's going to be coming out of our right hands. That's what the Qur'an describes on a couple of occasions. That light is supposed to help you navigate through this difficult path, so you and I can make it to the gates of heaven. That's the point of it, okay? Now why are there two kinds of light? One of those lights has to do with your sincerity to Allah and the genuineness of your faith. That's inside of your heart. Only you know that and Allah knows that. Nobody else can check it. The other light, as I mentioned, comes from your right hand. And that light is actually a representation of the things you and I did in this life. If you had good deeds to do, if you did good works, then those works are going to get converted into light on that day. So you've got these couple of torches on, on Judgment Day that are helping you navigate, that are helping you move forward, right? And at the end of the day, all of this conversation is, it's only got one purpose. You and I want to stand up on that day and we want to have some light on our hands. We want to be able to access that light so we can make our way to Jannah. 
Our Messenger والسلام, would describe that that light on Judgment Day that we're going to be raised with is not all the same for everybody. It's not all the same. There are some people who barely have enough light, they can barely see their feet as they walk. That's how much light they have. There are those who have so much light that they can see from, it's as though that you can see from one city to the next one. That's how much light you have. And that depends on the strength and the purity of our faith and the strength of the deeds we left behind, doesn't it? And so that's the reason the parable of light is important. This was not the subject of my khutbah. I just wanted to set the stage. Allah wanted us to understand the concept of light and how we have to preserve that light in ourselves. And we have to ensure that that investment is maintained and not killed before we make it before Allah on Judgment Day. Right now you won't notice it, but on that day everybody's going to be wishing they have it. Okay. Now, this parable that I, these two parables that I wanted to share with you, these examples that I wanted to share with you, are actually not about light. They're about darkness. They're at the end, the, tr the two tragic cases of people who are not going to have light, or who don't take advantage of the light that they have. And so I'll go through them one by one. Allah describes, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَسَرَابٍ بِقِيعَةٍ يَحْسَبُهُ الظَّمْآنُ مَاءً Allah says, as, the, as for those who've disbelieved, which can also be translated, those who've buried away, meaning buried their light away. That's one of the other ways you can think of the word kufr. Anyway, those who've denied and have been ungrateful and have buried their light away, what about them? Well, they are like somebody traveling in the middle of the day in a desert, and they see a sarab, which means a mirage. So a man is thirsty, a woman is thirsty, lost in the desert, and they're trying to find a place to survive. And of course, in the hot sun, you start seeing waves where there are no waves. Things get a little watery looking in the distance, and that's a mirage. And because you're dying of thirst, you think that's worth something. And so, يَحْسَبُهُ الظَّمْآنُ مَاءَ The desperately thirsty one runs towards that water, thinking that it's water. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَهُ Until the point where he reaches it. لَمْ يَجِدْهُ شَيْئًا He found nothing there. It was just sand. It was a false image. فَوَفَّاهُ حِسَابَهُ وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابُ So Allah, and He will only find Allah there. He was looking for water and Allah makes a strange turn in the example. He says instead of finding water there, He will find His Master there. فَوَجَدَ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ فَوَفَّاهُ حِسَابَهُ He'll find Allah there and Allah will com complete His account there. Allah will give Him what He deserves. وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ And Allah is quick in taking the audit. Allah is quick in taking account of all the things you and I did. That's the first example. I haven't explained it yet, I just want you to know what it is first. Now the quickly the second example. Oh, another example. And this is going to be almost the opposite scene. First time we were in the, in the desert, now we're going to be in the ocean. He says, كَظُلُمَاتٍ فِي بَحْرٍ It's like layers on top of layers on top of layers of darkness out at sea. So we're not talking about the daytime now. We're talking about the nighttime. In the first example, it was clearly daytime because you don't see a mirage at night, you only see it in the day. And now you're out at sea and you're covered in layers of darkness. And then he says, فِي ظُلُمَاتٍ فِي بَحْرٍ لُجِّيٍ لُجِّي means an ocean that is not merciful, that won't let up. Like the waves are getting violent and you're hoping it was just one bad wave and then things are gonna calm down. But no, the waves keep getting worse and worse and worse. Until يَغْشَاهُ مَوْجٌ مِنْ فَوْقِهِ مَوْجٌ A wave overtakes him. A wave is so huge out in the middle of sea that it crushes whatever vessel he's in, whatever boat or you know, ship that he's in, it's now underwater. And then مِنْ فَوْقِهِ موج. On top of that wave that's already slammed you into the water is another wave throwing you deeper inside. Min fawqihi sahab. And on top of that there are thunderstorm clouds. In other words, when the clouds are there, that's an indication a storm is coming, right? People that are experienced at being out at sea, they can see the clouds and know, we gotta get ready, things are about to get ugly. So Allah says that the waves are relentless and the storm's not letting up either. And this person, whoever they were, that poor soul, is being now drowned into, into, into the depths of the sea, in the middle of the darkness. And at the end of that parable, what does he say? إِذَا أَخْرَجَ يَدَهُ لَمْ يَكَدْ يَرَاهَا You're all the way at the bottom of the sea, you can't even try and get up. You try to get up, another wave comes and slams you down. That's the problem. You could try to swim your way up, but there's another wave on top. And so he says, 
He's so much lost in the dark that when he takes his hand out, لم يكد يراها, it's almost as if he can't even see his own hand. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نُورٍ Whoever Allah didn't give light to, how can they have any light? Whoever Allah didn't furnish any light, how can they have any light? So these, like I said in the beginning, these examples can be confusing. You might say, what does he mean by all of this? But I first wanted to kind of paint this scene for you, these two parables, these two examples, and what they, what they mean in brief translation. Now let's try to dig a little deeper and appreciate what's being said. Basically in both of these cases, a person is not seeing what they're supposed to. One person's in the middle of day, it's bright outside, and yet they see things that aren't there. They see a mirage, don't they? Which is as good as being blind. You might as well be in the dark because it's not there. What you see isn't there. And in the other case, somebody's in the dark, it's there, they're at sea, there's not even moonlight because it's covered by the clouds, there's these waves, you're blind in another way. They are, these are both sides of blindness. But why, why give two different sides of blindness? Because Allah is describing that on Judgment Day, people are going to come before Him that are, the unfortunate cases are going to be of two kinds. There are going to be two kinds of unfortunate cases. So here is where I'd like for you to pay extra attention, to understand what is going on in these parables. There are people who assume that they are in light. There are people that are like that person out in the desert, surrounded by light. You can't get brighter than the desert in the daytime. You know? So there are people that are in a good environment. They act religiously. They look religious, they talk religious, their family's religious, their community's religious, they're involved in the religious sense, they're involved at the masjid, they're, you know, so everything around them, they're not, they're not, they're not drinking alcohol, they're not in the party scene, they're not at the club, they're not, they're not in that scene. They're in, in a religious setting, they're in a spiritual setting, they're surrounded by light. And a lot of times we assume that people like that are straight one-way ticket to heaven. They're good, They're, they've made it. They've got no issues. But unfortunately, even when you're surrounded that, by that much light, you know what happens sometimes? You start becoming delusional. You start thinking that the appearance of looking religious, the words that you use that make you sound like you're religious, the outside of your being, being committed to the faith, you look like you're pretty enlightened, doesn't actually say anything about what's going on on the inside. They could be two very different realities. We have, unfortunately, in, uh, in the Muslim world, this is something Allah comments exhaustively on in the Qur'an. I'll just oversimplify it for now. Basically what happens is you have people that look very spiritual, very enlightened, very religious, very committed to the faith on the outside. And they commit to those things that make them look that way. So clothing becomes very important. Appearance becomes very important, you know, pronouncing certain utterances becomes very important. All the things that other people can perceive become important. But there's something going on inside of you like greed, like jealousy, like pride, you know, like anger, like hatred. You don't, you can't see somebody else succeed, it bothers you. You don't feel even a little bit of sympathy when you're being ruthless to children in the family. You don't consider the people whose rights you're taking away because it's all personal, nobody's gonna find out. You don't see it because it's not in front of people, so it doesn't matter. What is in front of people needs to look pristine. And what's going on inside is ugly. It's dark and these people assume that because they're doing good things, they're volunteering, they even grew out a beard, they put the hijab on, they even memorized some Qur'an, they worked on their tajweed, all the outside stuff is pretty good. They start assuming also that Allah is going to really reward me for all of this. I'm doing pretty good. As opposed to this other person who can't even recite the Fatiha, as opposed to that other person who can't even do this X, Y, or Z, they don't even pray in the masjid, or whatever else. You start comparing yourself thinking, you're doing pretty good because you're, you're in the light. And that, by the way, that sense of superiority is probably the worst of all of the other vices I mentioned.